Okay, so uh, I sent out the lesson, so if you guys don't have it, just nudge the person next to you and ask them to send it to you. But today we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Woo! And this is, this is one that spoke to me a little. This was a, a chapter that gave me a little nudge every now and then. Well, come on! So the title of my lesson is Get Out With The Sin And Get In With The Good. Ooh! So, I kind of thought that little slogan kind of throws a little slogan into your mind as well. Mm. Out with the old and in with the new. You guys remember that? Yeah. And this 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 day is an incredible day for myself and Marari as well. Oh. When it comes to getting out with the old and in with the new. Today is the last day that we get to pick out our foot of our cups. Today is the last day that I get to eat as much chocolate as I want. Oh. Um, I don't know Marari, we'll put a, a, a little boundary on that. Thank you for my wife. <laughs> but by tomorrow, we're going to be starting a new diet. Woo! For three whole months. Oh. Oh. And it's going to be painful. Oh. <laughs> it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be hard. Let's go Krispy Kreme. But that's, that's, that's where that saying, out with the old and in with the new comes yeah. along. You think to yourself, what is that new thing that is coming along? I remember the first time I was cutting. It was hard, but I felt good. Yeah. Ooh. So, Halfway into the kindness, some persecution came along. Mm. People started saying I was deflating. My suits were looking a bit baggy on me. <laughs> and and when, the, the, when that dieting came, I, I was struggling at some point as well. But in the end, it was great to see the good things that came. Mm. So today, how does that apply to this? Well, let's check it out. Point one of my sermon is, sin is a problem to the church. We need to get out with the old. And in first in Second Timothy chapter three, from verse one it says, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness but denying his power. Has nothing to do with such people. Man, this sounds like a heavy list. This sounds like a heavy list of things that are just completely wrong. So, Paul is pretty sweet in how he starts off this letter. He says, mark this. These words have some value. And some of you probably relate with me when I say it has even more value when it's used as a threat from your parents. I really got to understand a bit more about value in, in, this, in this word, in these two words, when Marani and I started sharing our schedules. If I didn't mark something down in my schedule or set a reminder, not only would it throw me off my day, but it would also leave Marani feeling confused. She didn't know what was going on. Uh, one minute I had to do one thing, and then one minute I'm thrown off and I have to do another thing, and Marani being my helper doesn't know what I'm doing, and so I don't know what, how I can get help from her, and everything is just out of control. Mm. And in the same way, Paul was warning Timothy, not to be taken by surprise. Don't be confused by the things to come. People are going to sin, and they are going to hurt the people around them. Sin is the biggest issue. Paul saw that sin was a bigger issue than the persecution at the time. He saw it was a bigger issue than those who were looking to hurt the people in the faith. But the funny thing is, we're all sinners. Everyone in this church is a sinner. I myself being a sinner as well, so I'll be the first to take that thing. But Paul was warning him about the Christians in the church who sin while pursuing righteousness. Paul was warning him about the sinners those who call themselves Christians, but were living a life of sin. Mm. And Paul uses this list specifically. These, this list being a list of sins that start from the heart. He says, to start off the list, people will be lovers of themselves. These people feeling entitled and wanting attention. Lovers of money. For the love of, love of money is everything to these people, greater than everything else. These people will be boastful, are uh, always talking about their own deeds before others. Proud, thinking they can do better. Or on the other end of the spectrum, thinking they are good for nothing. Abusive, extremely insulting or offensive, 
disobedient to their parents, they don't honor their mom and dad, ungrateful, not even a thought about what others have done for them, unholy, something, is holy, something that is holy is set apart from God. These people are entangled with the world. Without love, no patience, kindness, compassion, they're pretty much the opposite to everything said about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Mm. Unforgiving, these people hold on to past hurts and use it as a weapon against everyone else in their life. Slanderous, telling lies about people and spoiling a person's reputation. Mm. Without self-control, the outburst of actions based on feelings. Brutal, a violent person. Not lovers of the good, this person finds pleasure in seeing bad things happen to other people. Treacherous, a deceptive person. They don't tell lies, but nor do they tell the truth. Rash, acting or speaking without consideration of the consequences. Mm. Conceited, excessively proud of themselves. Lovers of pressure, uh, pleasure rather than lovers of God. They love what makes them feel good. To sum it up, Paul states, Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. These people appear to us as godly. These people know a lot. These people have good deeds, but they don't allow the power of God to work in their own life. And instead, they go on living this way. Have nothing to do with them. To pretty much sum up that phrase, have nothing to do with them, have nothing to do with them. Don't, I mean, don't hang out with them, don't talk to them. Don't spend time with them. Don't take anything from them. They don't even follow them on social media. Ooh. There is no exception. I believe that even Paul, with all his wisdom and insights, he wouldn't talk to these people. Even if they were close friends. A person that appears to be godly, but is really living in this way, is not to be accepted in God's kingdom, in his family, or in his church. But... Why did Paul feel so strongly about this? Paul had gone to many places and had seen many things happen. To the church, in the church, around the church. And this is what Paul had seen in respect to these people. From verse 6, it says, They are the kind to worm their way into homes and gain control of a gullible woman, who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by, the, by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul did not see these people as friends to be trusted. Mm. These people were people who misled other people with a weaker understanding. They misled those who trusted them and who were easily misled. These were people that carried with them a heavy load of sin and they did not want to get over. These were people that didn't want to confess their sins out of prayer. They were caught up in their own desires for pleasure, not righteousness. These people, these people that had a lot of knowledge, these were people who had a lot of knowledge, but in their, in their lives they knew nothing. They know lots of cool things, but none of it actually helps them gain salvation. And this is crazy. Sometimes we can look at people who know a lot of things. Sometimes we can look to people who are living a cool life and we do want it. But we don't see the deeper thing in their life. I know me and Sean have faced this a lot when it comes to being out there on campus. I know Pascal and I recently got into a Bible study where we, faced, where we had someone who knew a lot of stuff. And some of these people, man, they know things that I don't know. And I'm embarrassed, guy. What did you say? Google on <laughs> I'm, I'm just getting confused. There was this one time when Sean and I got into a conversation with this one gentleman and he was dropping names of different things. He was dropping different analogies. He was dropping different insights. He was talking about all types of different doctrines. And Sean and I just left overwhelmed and confused and didn't know what we had just gone into. We were confused. These guys know a lot. And then I found myself wanting his love. I found myself wanting his knowledge. I was so caught up in my love for knowledge and wisdom that I wanted what he had. Mm. I wanted that life that he had, the studying he had. I wanted his books. I would probably ask for his library card or something. <laughs> I wanted that. But then, when you actually look at these people's lives, what 
do you see? You see a gentleman that knows so much about salvation, so he says, but yet doesn't know enough to want to show love to other people around him and save their lives too. You see so many people know so many different things and how to apply life into their uh, love into their life, love and kindness and compassion, but yet you see no love, kindness or compassion in their life. I may know nothing, if not a little, but I am happy to see the power in my life when I'm able to love others. I am happy. And that's what we need to hold on to. We need to hold on to the power that we allow God to have in our life. Not appearing to be godly, but actually allowing God to work in our life. As one saying goes, we don't need to go chasing rainbows. <laughs> so, we need to keep our church pure of these things. What is church for? Church is for the hypocrites that are fighting to not be hypocrites. Mm. Church is for the selfish that want to be giving. Church is for the abusive that really want to be say nice things to other people. Come on. Church is for the boastful that want to lift up others before themselves. Mm. This is what church is for. Yeah. Anyone who is boastful comes to church and continues being boastful without the desire to change can't be part of this church. Mm. So the challenge is, with this point, keep yourselves poor, pure. Keep yourselves pure by holding on to the power of God. In the smallest aspect, rep repentance is one. Focus on repentance, being loving and being kind. Second challenge, with this point, keep the church pure by getting into each other's lives and helping one another both and focusing on one another. Helping each other then we can keep our church pure of those worms. Point two, righteousness is a problem to the world. Believe it or not, us being righteous is a situation to everyone else out there. From verse 10 it says, You however know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, uh, uh, patience, love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What, kind of, uh, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch? Iconomy, I, sorry, Iconomy, and Lystria. The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued, rescued me from one of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted, while evildoers, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Fact is fact. Not everything about the Christian life is relative. Some of the relative things can be the type, type of shoes you wear as a Christian. Some of the relative things can be the type of clothes you wear to church on a Sunday. But there are facts about the Christian life. For one, a Christian is someone, a Christian is someone who is a disciple of Jesus Christ. We see this in Acts chapter 11 from verse 26 to the later part. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The word, the Anti uh, people in Antioch here spoke Greek, and so the word used is Christianus, which means a follower of Christ. Fact. Another fact is that a Christian is going to be persecuted. As Jesus too said in John 15, if, you, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. If a person is going out of their way to avoid persecution, that person too is not a Christian. But don't get me wrong, don't go around picking fights. <laughs> yes, persecute, yes, Christians get persecuted, but don't go around looking for fights if you feel as though you don't get persecuted or enough persecution. Mm. In a letter before this, that uh, first Timothy, Paul encourages Timothy to pray for peace and safety so that many can, so that many can be won over. From verse 1 in uh, first Timothy chapter 2, it says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So it is intent, Paul is encouraging to be people, priests, 
pray for peace in your family. If your mom and father are persecuted, pray for peace so that they too can come out to church one day in complete peace and holiness. Yeah. So this is pretty this is pretty sweet. So why did Paul get persecuted? Let's look at his words one more time. You however know what about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecution and suffering. Paul was faithful, Paul was patient, Paul was loving, and he endured. He was persecuted and suffered for others. This was not a man that went around picking fights with people. The fights came to him. Christians get persecuted because evil gets worse. We love and we love and give more and more as we grow as Christians. The more you grow, the more you learn to love in different ways. The more you grow, the more areas in your life you see, I need to give here and I need to give there. The more money you get, you also grow yeah. <laughs> to give more. Uh, and even the more uh, family you have, you learn to love and more people. So the more you grow as a Christian, the more you learn to give and love. But over the years, sin has also gotten worse. Lies increase. Today, false teachings spread. The church, even I, the church that I even grew up in, taught that righteousness can be found in safe sex. The world is really getting worse. Paul's love for people, his faithfulness to the word of God, and his endurance to preach the truth, will persecute, will persecution his way from those who were against these things. Personally, when I when I first learned about persecution. I went out there to every single person I could find and picked a fight. I said, hey, come fight me. Let's talk. Let's fight with the, with the word of God. <laughs> it's the word of God. <laughs> I don't know if I, was, if I would have gone to that extent, but I'm happy I did it. Amen. Amen. So I read books so I can have better arguments. Never had I ever read so much. I studied my Bible not so that I can grow in my love, but just so I can prove a point. Unfortunately, at the time, not now, I was told that look at that going out there and looking for fights was in fact me persecuting them. Wow. So uh, I'm thankful for that little uh, correction right there. Mm -hmm. Well, I really learned persecution when people started leaving the church because the church was too bloody. Mm -hmm. When people chose to, to go away from the church and talk to their friends about how weird we are, simply because we loved them. Because we give love to other people. Persecution for Christ is being loving as someone hates you because you're loving. Not, not going out there and picking the fights. Mm -hmm. So, don't pray for persecution. Don't look for an opportunity to be persecuted. Just be righteous and ready for if the time ever comes. Mm -hmm. Point number three, coming in for close. Get equipped for every good one. Oh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, chapter 3 from verse 14 it says, But as for you, continue in what you have learned, and become convinced of it, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I gave and I gave because I loved the sport. Come on. And I believed I can do it. Unfortunately for this game though, we lost. Oh. Yeah, it was a sad defeat. Our, our teamwork started messing up. We no longer passed the ball around. Um, I myself made a couple of mistakes of being the best of the team. But because I played the whole game, and, we, and my mistakes were, because of that, more obvious, my teammates blamed me for our loss. They blamed me. I, I couldn't be in the same change room anymore because we were all just arguing with one another. I remember walking out, and, and I was sad. I was, I was angry, and I didn't want to play basketball again. But my dad, who knows nothing about basketball, came up to me, and he put his arm on me and said, Hey, Chris. Don't give up because someone tells you you're rubbish. Don't give up because someone tells you you're bad. If you believe in it, if you believe you can do it, keep on doing it. Mm. If you believe you have what it takes but don't have the skills, 
keep on trying and you will get better. You will get good. And because of that, I didn't quit. No matter the persecution, no matter the hatred, no matter the insults, no matter how much I did receive the ball for the next following weeks, I did not quit. Because my dad told me to continuously go. Come on, Christopher. In the same way, Timothy is looking, sorry, Paul is looking to Timothy, and he's saying, keep on going, Timothy. Here, we see Paul is encouraging Timothy to keep on doing what he believes in. To keep on preaching the truth that he was convinced of from the time his mother first told him the scriptures. The scriptures uh, were entangled in Timothy's life. They were his life. He grew up with a Jewish mother that taught him the Old Testament, taught him the, the Holy Scriptures, which we now look at as the Old Testament. This is where his mother took. And because of this, his grandmother, his mother, and himself were able to come to the knowledge of Christ because of the, what they were once taught. His life was entangled with the Scriptures. And he believed in it. He believed in the Scriptures. Paul knew this, and it was for this reason Paul called him to continue preaching the Word of God, whatever persecution may have come his way. In this, Timothy's faith was confirmed. This chapter is closed off with Paul confirming Timothy's conviction. Yes, every scripture is from God. Mm. Don't let those worms tell you differently. Mm. Every scripture is from God, no matter how much they know or have studied or have heard. I once studied the uh, Bible with this one gentleman. He knew so much about the Bible, more than what I myself knew, but yet did not believe it was from God. Mm -hmm. And in this, we need to apply the Bible to our life. Paul is teaching Timothy to use it. Paul confirms Timothy's com convictions of the scriptures and encourages him to use it. In uh, verse 16 to 17, all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We've got to use the scriptures on ourselves. Allow us, allow yourself to be taught. Timothy had to be taught by Paul. Allowing yourself to be rebuked. Every now and then, Timothy did have to get a stone correction. Allowing yourself to be corrected. No one knows the complete truth. So why shut yourself down from finding out through correction? Allowing you, sorry, no one knows every truth. Allowing yourself to be trained. Timothy needed to imitate Paul. It was by this that through persecution, Timothy could do every good work. Well, uh, for one thing, he could do it all thoroughly because he was thoroughly equipped for every good work and teaching. To be able to teach all the Christians around him to do the exact same. So, do you believe that the scriptures are from God? Mm. Let's find out if you believe. One simple question. How are you using the scriptures in your own life? Mm. Don't challenge. Open yourself up to being taught. Open yourself up to being corrected. Mm. Open yourself up to doing the same thing over and over and over again and someone training you. Open yourself up. I had to work with my heart on this one for a rebuke. Every now and then. Open yourself up. Study the Bible. Look to be taught by someone who you don't usually get taught by. Someone who's not your disciple. Also take it as a great as well. In conclusion, sin is a problem to the church. We've got to get it out of the church. We've got to keep it out of the church. And we've got to keep each other pure by getting into each other's lives. Righteousness is a problem to the world. As long as we pursue righteousness, we can, we will be a problem to the world. So, amen for those who like to argue, but don't make any facts. And then get equipped for every good. Use the Bible in your own life, in every way. And you are able to use the Bible in everyone else's life. And to God, you are